Hi, Bill Nadera here, and welcome to my channel, where I share with you cases from my clinical practice to help you perform better endodontics. The case we're going to look at today is a retreatment case. Tooth number three, diagnosed with previous root canal treatment and symptomatic apical periodontitis. Let's take a look at the PA. So when we look at PAs of previously treated teeth, I look at the quality of the obturation, I look at the length, I look at the size of the canals, I look at how the root canal treatment was performed originally. And looking at this image, it appears that the quality of the obturation is certainly within a standard of care. We see the length of the root canal treatment within the range of what we consider the standard of care. So why is this tooth uncomfortable for this patient. Whenever I see a patient with previous root canal treatment, especially one in this particular case where the patient claims the treatment was completed over 10 years ago and has been quiet ever since, I have to start thinking what's going on here inside this case that's creating these particular symptoms. Are we dealing with additional anatomy? Are we dealing with coronal leakage? Are we dealing with some sort of contaminant that was that had been surviving in that root canal system for years and all of a sudden the biological floor has changed to the point where it's overwhelmed the immune system? So there's a lot of different things that we could be dealing with here in a situation like this. So I've got my cone beam opened up here and it opens up again into all three views as a quick overview, I'm going to always open up my sagittal view first. It's the image that we're most familiar with from our PAs. We can toggle back and forth out from the buckle, and we can see the two buckle roots that were treated. Kind of a longer tooth. We see the apex of these roots shy of the actual maxillary sinus. So I'm looking at the palatal root now, looking for any issues with there. Again, the length here looks good. On all these roots, I can't fault the length. I can't fault the original root canal treatment. Taking a look at the axial next, we're going to maximize that here. I always read my axial scan starting at the coronal, working my way apically. So I'm going to start advancing this scan in the apical direction. And as I advance apically here, we should see those three radiodense areas from the previous root canal treatment. Mesial buckle, distal buckle, palatal. And as I get to about the mid-root level, my attention on maxillary molars is drawn to that mesiobuccal root complex. We can see the mesiobuccal root complex, and it's almost an ovoid shape. But yet the obturation material is weighted towards the buccal. What we know about root systems and canal anatomy is symmetry. Things are rarely weighted to one side or the other. There's generally a symmetrical distribution of that canal anatomy throughout the entire aspect of that root system. So the first thing I start thinking as to why this tooth became symptomatic is an untreated mesiobuccal II canal system. I'm going to continue advancing this apically, and as we get down to about that middle third, we still see this ovoid appearance. So the relationship of the external morphology and the potential internal canal anatomy is holding its shape throughout the entire root system. And if this is an untreated MB2, well, that's a good reason why this tooth becomes symptomatic. Let's take a look at the coronal view here. And again, we're looking at that mesiobuccal root complex. And what we're seeing here is confirmed with what we saw in the axial. This is out towards the buckle here. This is in towards the palatal. We're seeing the maxillary sinus here. We're seeing inflammation of the Schneiderian membrane. But we're also seeing a broad root system with the obturation material weighted towards the buckle. This tooth has become symptomatic due to an unaddressed mesiobuccal II root complex. So now we have to discuss what our options are with our patient. So what are our realistic options? Well, option one is no treatment. Patients can always elect to live with their current problem. Option two, tooth can be removed. The most successful dental procedure we have, although most people prefer to try to save their teeth, but it's an option. Option three, surgical root canal treatment. Is it wrong to take a surgical approach to something like this? Well, it depends on your philosophy. My philosophy is treat internal first, so surgical approach to a case like this, probably low on my list. Option four, full root canal retreatment, meaning remove the crown, 
even make an access through the crown, remove all the obturation material and restorative material with inside that root system, which is a legitimate approach. But we have a fifth option. And the fifth option, I believe, is a more conservative approach for something like this. And that's what we consider to be a selective root retreatment. When we choose the option of a selective root retreatment, we have to look back at our cone beam scan. We have to verify that there is no pathological findings at the apex of the distal buccal root or the palatal root, because if we're planning on not approaching those or treating those, they have to be stable. So looking back at our scan, I'm gonna take a closer look at this distal buccal root. From the coronal view, I don't see any signs of any apical pathology here. Nothing that concerns me. And what we also see is a nice view of the palatal root. I don't see any widened PDL. I don't see any areas of apical pathology. So does it make sense to remove all that obturation material from that root system when there's no pathology visible on the CBCT scan? Maybe not. I believe that this tooth qualifies for the selective root retreatment approach, which is what we decided to do in this particular case. Now, whenever I do a selective root retreatment, especially on maxillary molars, I treat the mesial buccal root complex as a whole. I won't just treat the MB2, I'll treat both the MB and the MB2, because we know from a histological studies that there's a lot of intracanal anastomoses and communications between the MB and the MB2. So the entire complex for me gets treated as a whole. So when we do selective root retreatment cases, we've got to start treatment planning for the access we need to develop these precision slot accesses. And after you've done a few of these, these become a little bit more intuitive, but when you're learning how to do this, we can gain a lot of information from the cone beam scan and where these accesses need to start. And we use the axial view. So I'm gonna magnify the axial view. I'm gonna pull this back down to the level of where we start seeing the previous treatment. We're gonna make sure that everything is down that long axis of the mesial buccal root. We'll have an idea of where we wanna be, right in this particular area. I'm going to place a measurement mark here to the mesial. I'm going to actually take another measurement mark and measure from the buccal to the area where I wanna search. And I'll take one from the distal and I'm marking my target. In this particular software program, I can leave those measurements in place and drag the scan back to the coronal surface. And since I have everything lined up with the long axis of that mesial buccal root, I can see my target of where I have that MB2 identified on the scan. Now the perimeters out here have changed. That's okay. So what I can do is click back on these measurements and drag them a little bit further. And what this is going to do is gonna give me an estimated target on the occlusal surface on where I should start that access. The information I'm getting from the cone beam suggests that my access should start about four and a half to five millimeters from the buckle, about two millimeters from the mesial aspect of that mesial marginal ridge and we can verify that by another five millimeters coming exactly from the distal. I can take this measurement, I can translate that to the occlusal surface with a periodontal probe and mark my entry point. For this particular situation, I chose to do a single tooth isolation technique using rubber dam block out material to create that nice aseptic feel. I started my access through this restoration using those markers that I was able to develop from that cone beam scan. It's up to me now to maintain the vertical orientation in order to find these canal systems. And I always encourage that we establish some sort of target vertical depth point, meaning we go back to that cone beam scan and we understand the level of where that occlusal surface is to where that root canal system should be. That helps us make sure we're maintaining a good vertical orientation as we're advancing down to find these root canal systems. As I advance deeper inside this tooth, we begin to see some evidence of where that previous root canal treatment was done. If you've reached your target vertical depth and you still haven't seen anything that you expect to see, stop. Take an image, reassess your orientation to make sure that you're not off track. So as I continue advancing and removing some of that prior material that was in that access, I then can uncover the obturation material from the mesial buckle. 
And what we're looking at here is the gutta percha from that mesial buccal canal. Once I know where the mesial buccal is, I now need to start looking for that MB2. It's going to be sitting underneath the mesial marginal ridge. We can take a measurement from the cone beam scan and understand what that distance is. So I'll begin troughing towards the palatal underneath the mesial marginal ridge. I'm being very conservative. There's a couple of different things you could use at this point. You could use ultrasonics is probably the safe way to do it. You could use burrs, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Either way, you want whatever you're using to remove tooth structure to be flat. Because if you're using something pointy, then it's difficult to distinguish between root canal anatomy and gouges that, that are placed on that dentinal floor. So based on the measurements from my cone beam scan, we can clearly see a little spot a little spot right where that cone beam told me that it was going to be. That's the MB2. This is after the orifice has been opened. And a couple of things I want to point out here. When we compare side by side where we initially saw the start of that MB2, it was just a little spot. But after we open our orifice, we can see that the orifice has been moved to a little bit further underneath that mesial marginal ridge. The way it branches from the pulp chamber proper is extremely acute. So we now have to move that orifice over underneath the mesial marginal ridge or else we're going to have a very, very difficult time obtaining length on this particular root system. The yellow arrow identifies where the orifice used to be and the orange arrow represents where this orifice has been translocated in order to remove some of that constrictive dentin so that we have a better opportunity to treat this root canal system efficiently. After the MB2 has been fully shaped, I then remove the material from the mesial buccal root system using a combination of rotary instrumentation and gutta percha softening agents. Once all that material is removed, we then run through our disinfection protocols. In this particular case, I used a positive pressure irrigation technique. Once the area has been completely disinfected, the canals are dried and we move forward with our obturation technique. My preferred way to obturate the root canal system is a single cone obturation with bioceramic sealer. I always encourage cone fit images being taken so you can identify exactly where your obturation material is flowing. This particular cone fit, I don't see the palatal, I don't see the distal buckle, but it doesn't matter to me. I am only merely want to see the mesial buckle root complex. And we can see with this working image that we see two separate exit points on this mesial buckle root complex. I always evaluate my cone fit images for voids. I look for voids in the coronal, look for voids in the mid root, and I look for voids in the apical. And my rule is that if there's a void somewhere in the coronal or the mid-root area, I may consider applying a little bit of vertical heat to help the material flow into that voided area. If, in fact, the void is in the apical third, I'll remove my cone, re-inject my sealer, and I'll try again. I was happy with my cone fit image, so I went ahead moving forward with my final obturation by taking a heat source and searing off the gutta percha at the level of the orifice using a 5.7 plugger to condense and compact that obturation material in the coronal third. I generally like to place a final restoration, but if I'm working with a restorative dentist that doesn't like me placing the final restoration, I'm always going to place a minimum of a three millimeter thick bonded orifice barrier to protect that work. And then I'll close the case with a little piece of endodontic sponge and cavit and send the patient back to the restorative dentist for the final restoration. This approach does a wonderful service for your patient. We can see here we kept the axis extremely conservative. We targeted our treatment just for that mesial buccal root complex and accomplished everything we needed to with the help from the information that we had on that cone beam scan. This is our final post-operative image. We can see a well-treated mesial buccal root complex, but we're not seeing both canals in this particular view. And that's why I always encourage at least two post-operative images to help demonstrate those other canal systems, a straight on and some sort of angled view either to the mesial or to the distal. I was able to get this patient back for a follow-up about two and a half years after I completed this treatment. Patient has remained symptom-free for the last two and a half years and functional in that area. Looking at our cone beam scan, I see no signs of any apical pathology on either the distal buccal or the mesial buccal root. We see no inflammation anymore here of the Schneiderian membrane. That's completely resolved. Switching to the coronal view, we see well-centered 
root canal anatomy. We also see a little bit of communication and anastomoses between these two canal systems. We see those areas of high density showing well-centered anatomy in that mesial buccal root complex. Clinically, there are no signs of swelling, no signs of infection. The area is functional. It's negative to percussion. There are no unusual probing depths. We also see that restoration that was placed post endodontic treatment by the restorative dentist has been maintained and is still intact, providing a nice conservative treatment outcome for this patient. Selective root retreatment should be used wisely, and it's based on a lot of different variables. The selective root retreatment process can offer the patient a conservative option where we're not fully disassembling the tooth, yet still establishing a disease-free environment for this patient for the best long-term retention of the tooth. I hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of mine today, and I look forward to seeing you on future videos. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'm Bill Dadera. Thanks for watching.